If you enjoy this episode of the Workflows Photography Podcast, hit that subscribe or follow button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast player you are listening from. Welcome to Workflows, presented by Imagine AI. Workflows is a podcast about saving you time and money in your photography business. Hear from people just like you. Put down that camera for a little, connect the headphones, and get to work with Workflows. Dave Shea is an entrepreneurially minded photographer who loves working at the intersection of art and technology. From repairing cameras for Leica and Fujifilm, to starting his own photography business and being an ambassador for MagMod and SLR Lounge, Dave always seeks new challenges. His most significant business challenge came in the form of busyness. In 2013, Dave photographed over 53 weddings, up from 15 the year prior, with no reliable systems in place to handle double-digit growth. Dave grappled with burnout. Learning from his life lessons, Dave made it a mission to help photographers simplify their workflows and build better systems. I am very excited about this conversation with Dave because, well... He and I are very similar in so many ways. <laughs> so with that, let's get into this conversation with Dave Shea. Hey, Dave, what's going on? Not too much, man. I'm just uh, getting ready to uh, kick off a few shoots this week and get back into the swing of things. How about you? I actually do have a, I have a, I have got a client job to do this weekend. Uh, oh, okay. Which I, you just made me realize I still <laughs> have that coming up. I don't, I don't take on client work as much as I used to these days, but I'm actually photographing client that I did their engagement I guess at this point, four years ago. Okay. And uh, they now have two kids. So oh. we're, yeah, we're going actually going back to the same spot we did the engagement session to do a family session. So it should be really cool. Ah, oh, that's really cool. I like that kind of like yeah, repeat client really thing. Excited. Yep, that's awesome. Yep, for sure. So let's dive right into the topics at hand. That First question that, uh, that I ask every guest is, what is one thing that you do for the photographic process that has saved you time, the, the, the be behind the camera, you know, that kind of part. Yeah. So, I mean, automation and, and kind of like moving things in a more streamlined fashion is, is the key to what I've, what I've done historically, right? Like I've spent so much, so much of my time focused on how much, what can I do to enjoy photography as a career without spending my entire life photographing right like I, I i'm not the let's bring cameras everywhere i go kind of person i kind of like try to mm -hmm. automate as much as possible and so in terms of in camera and stuff like that i am the like biggest stickler among me and my team for like get it in camera like if it is not perfect coming out of the camera i i don't i won't deliver it i won't do the stuff on the back end so like my editing process is very very nice because of that but like when it comes to saving time and during the photographic process i've got my cameras calibrated to my like the back of my camera screen and my lightroom screen like look identical and so like when i'm taking a shot in camera and i, I look at it on the back of like the camera I'm like all right this is this is exactly how I want it to look. And so one of the things that has really kind of cut down when I first started photography, my, my joke is that like the better I get as a photographer, the less time I spend editing it is like when I first started photography, I, I was I did an engagement session and it was like, it's like an hour and a half engagement session. I want to say it took me like seven or eight hours to, to edit, right? Because I was like mm -hmm. photoshopping stuff out of every single background. I was paying attention to like all this extra stuff in the images and everything, like trying to get every detail perfect. But like as I kind of forced myself to say, all right, what is my composition? What is my color? What is my white balance? Like, how am I getting this? To the point where like I could be one of those people that like condescendingly shoots JPEG and like wants people to know that I shoot JPEG, but I'm not quite there. Like I'm always like, like my safety net, but I try to get that stuff just right. Perfect out of camera. Yeah. I, I think it's so important to, to spend the time to get it as close to what you're, what you have, you know, in your head in yeah. camera. It, it really is so important. I mean, it's like, you know, I would, I would much prefer to not ever bring a light with me and just rely on natural light. But sometimes yeah. you just, you have to use a natural, I mean, an artificial light in order yeah. to get whatever it is going on in your head. Right. So well, that's why, like I was, I was very much in the same camp. Like I, I was a, a very, like a self-proclaimed natural light photographer for a long time. But then I realized like I would find myself in situations where like I would spend a ton of time in post correcting for these like situations. Like if I just put a light here, like this would not be the issue that it is. And that's how I got like connected with different lighting companies and stuff like that was just through like, all right, 
what do I need to do to make sure that when stuff is like coming out of my camera, it is good to go. Like even like like yeah. my double exposures or like my more artistic portraits, mm -hmm. very, very rarely am I spending time in post-production on those outside of a simple, very simple tweak and sometimes a little bit of light color correction. And that's that's about it. But that comes at like the like what how many pictures have I taken at this point like four million or five million I think my Lightroom catalog was up to last I checked like it's coming a, a pretty hefty time in investment to say the least yeah 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 for sure for sure so so then what is one thing you do for the business side of things that has saved you time or money this is so that that's my the, this is like my like favorite thing to talk about because like when mm -hmm. when we get into photography right like a lot of times we get into it because we we're creators or we're artists at heart like sometimes people get into it and they're a business owner first and they see an opportunity there but a majority of the photographers that I work with in in my mentoring and coaching and when I've kind of like gotten just to know throughout the community we get into this because we like to make stuff we like to kind of create something cool for couples and it just kind of photography gives you just such a unique way to do that where you can work with things that are natural like natural light around you and you can work with things where you can just make something crazy like you can take an incredible off-camera flash shot that no one would ever guess is like next to the dumpster behind the hotel but like you made it work <laughs> right like and so you're able to just create so much but on the business side of things so often I found myself at least really struggling so like I, I grew my business pretty quick on the artist side of things I got in and I was like oh let's look at how awesome this is going. I went from five weddings my first year, 15 my second, and then I went to 53 my third. And I zero stars, do not recommend. The money was great. The, the situation was terrible. And it taught me a really valuable lesson when it comes to saving time on the back end that like you have to find what you're good at and you have to be able to scale things up from there. And what most photographers do is they we, we set our business up so that we are its failure point and it can never grow beyond where we are. And that's the biggest mistake that I've made. And so one of the, the tweaks that I've made since I, I really had this kind of like boil over in 2014 and 2015 is looking at how to kind of remove myself from the equation to, to quote Tron legacy is to how can I take things off of my responsibility and, and automate them or grow them and set them up for scale. And so when it comes to the, the backend systems, I've spent a lot of time focusing on different CRMs and different automation tools like Zapier, IFTTT, um, managing like things and sometimes you can get like super technical like you can dive in and do things with like web hooks and all sorts of crazy stuff or you can just be like right. i want zapier to do this for me and i don't want to deal with any of the hard technical stuff but like blog <laughs> right. posts things that are repeatable like my blog posts mm -hmm. all of them are automated when my clients fill out a survey that survey then comes into my studio manager my manager then sends it out to blog posts or wordpress through zapier and the whole process takes me 10 15 minutes to blog Am I the SEO genius? Am I doing fantastically? No. Am I doing well? Yeah. So like find where like you've got these repeatable, scalable processes and really hone in on them to see how you can improve those processes. It's one of those things that I think a lot of people don't realize. You're answering the same email 50 times a year with every single client. Wouldn't it be easier if you just made a blog post out of that email and then sent it to them before they send it to you, right? Or before they ask you the question, right? right? Like there's so much right. stuff like that and our businesses are just full of those opportunities. And you know there 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 are ways to do what you're doing with automation to create a blog post, for example, and make it sort of like ready for search engines. Oh um, yeah. But that might that might take like more de more developer you know in, mm -hmm. uh, involvement to do uh, spinning of the, of words and and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But you know anything is doable. And uh, but but there are actually so there's even outsourced blogging companies for the yeah. photo industry that are basically doing what you're doing. They're automating it to get their, basically like you would go as the client, submit submit the, the, the wedding that you photographed or whatever it is, submit some of the information, they'd ask a bunch of questions. It will deliver them a blog post ready for their writers to then manually spin words to make yeah. it <laughs> more yeah. more SEO. So it, there's uh, some human involvement there, but but yeah, I, I I agree. If you can streamline any part of your business with automation, whether it is a Zapier or an, or an IFTTT thing or whatever it is, it's a big win. It's a big win to, to automate well, it's, that stuff. It's huge, and I think a lot of people don't realize. So like one of the weird habits I've gotten into since kind of like, and it was like a like when I say a failure of mine, like I, I mean a failure. Like I, I built up a business that was very successful. Money wise, financially, we were we were doing fantastic. But in terms of the mental toll that it took on me, that it took on my family, like we really restarted the business completely after watching it grow and then watching kind of like what the repercussions of that growth were. 
And so one of the weird kind of like habits that I've picked up since then is once, usually about now it's about once a quarter or once every two quarters that I'll actually go in, but I will audit every single email that's coming into my inbox from clients and every interaction that I have with my clients. And I will look for commonalities between them. And I will say, all right, you know what? I had three engagement sessions that all asked me what their what my recommendations were when it came to picking a place, right? Or what my recommendations were on outfits they were supposed to wear. And a lot of people have gotten really good with like specifically outfit selection, like, hey, here's my style guide or here's this. But like, think about that in terms of every email. If every single client emails you and goes, hey, I know I've got a balance coming up, how do I pay that? You need to streamline your payment process, right? Like you need to look at that. And that's like one of those like real life tactical decisions that I've started to do is like, I will go through my entire inbox and I will like in an <laughs> Excel spreadsheet, like a psychopath, I'll be like, what's the topic of this? What could I have done to resolve it? And if I see that, like that same theme more than three times, I will like usually do something big to prioritize fixing that in the weeks or months to come so that I can preempt that. Because then like how, if right. I figure if one client asked me how many clients didn't have that or had that same question and didn't think, you know, maybe I don't want to bother him or whatever it is like I want to solve their problem, too. And I think some of the best ways that we can we can grow our business, we can build it is by really just managing those client expectations proactively and intentionally. One thing that, that I did was, uh, so I, I don't use a CRM because I mm -hmm. don't have the client volume to necessitate it. So I, I, I'm on pr in purposefully because I have a full-time job. I keep my client <laughs> workload very low. But, you know, I was running into an issue at one point where clients would say, you know, I, I collected payments through Square, uh, mm -hmm. the deposit. They would say, okay, so when do you want me to pay the, the remainder? And it's, it's like the day of, right? Uh, all that yeah. stuff. And it was very manual. But... Then Square eventually came out with the ability to automate half, yeah. you know, partial payments. So the moment that they did that, I was like, <laughs> I'm automating this thing. Uh, yeah. I don't want to have to get that question and, and answer that question anymore. So now, like when I when I would set up the invoice, I would literally set it up with the, you know, day of for the deposit or day of like sending the invoices of the deposit and day of the photo session for the other half, the remaining yeah. balance. and. They put in the credit card once and it would automate the entire thing. So well, that's just it. Like you find yeah. those ways to just streamline like small things. Like, so when I first started out before I had a CRM, like I had this, I would, I would make like a Google doc for like every couple. Mm -hmm. And I'd just be like, Hey, here's all the stuff you need to know. And it would have like little, like, and it was like not well done at all. Right. And then I took it like to the opposite mm -hmm. extreme where I would try to make like a customized web page for every single couple mm -hmm. that I worked with. So I like make like a page on my site and be like, and then I'd like use pictures from their engagement session and like all this stuff. And like, it, it just got out of hand quickly, but like, any step that you can do to keep your client informed without you having to think of every single client that you have and make a mental list of like, all right, Katie's wedding is next week. Lisa and, and Kayla is this coming month. How do I like you? Like, you're not going to be able to manage that in any sort of world, no matter like if you have three clients, if you have 40, you're not going to wind up being able to be like, oh, yeah, just mentally. I, I, that's what's coming up. Like eventually that's going to lead to burnout. It's going to lead to stress or it's going to lead to a missed client connection. And mm -hmm. so that, like just being intentional about, all right. Where are my opportunities to do better here? It's just such a massive opportunity for so many people when it comes to photography yeah. and running their business on the backside. For sure, for sure. Okay, so so earlier you mentioned that you like to, you know, try to get as much done in camera as possible. You know, there, it does involve, you know, the manual editing mm -hmm. to, to get you to your final results. So what is one thing that you've done for the editing part of the process that has saved you time? So this is a, a timely, so I am a, a preset base person more than anything else. So when, when I go to edit, Lightroom has presets in every, so every area. It's not just develop presets that apply like your tone curve and stuff like that. You can apply presets for your metadata. You can apply presets for your export, your all that stuff, right? So everything I do is broken down to preset. So if you'd asked me this like two months ago, I, that would have been like my key answer, right? But like Scott, right. you and I have to, to, talked about like using using Imogen and a lot of all that stuff. Like I have a very strict rule when I'm editing. And I, so I've done all my own editing for the 10 years. I had like one year where I tried outsourcing and I was like, oh, let's see if I can pay somebody else. And the cost and right. all that stuff had factored into that decision. When I'm editing, I have a rule where if it is not going to be an image that my client is going to print or I am going to use in my portfolio, if there is not client value there or if there is not company value there, I will not spend more than five seconds on that image. No matter what's wrong with like 
if there's an exit sign, great. There's an exit sign in that image now forever, right? Like that, that's kind yeah. of my approach. Like if the client yeah. does not find value in it and, the, and there's, there's a ton of those pictures throughout the day, right? Like some of my clients really care about details. So that client value might look different for a bride that has like a full like lay flat and all this stuff, right? Like that might be a big thing for her there. But then during like the reception and stuff, like there might be different parts where like, I've just got a guest dancing. It's not somebody that I know is close to the couple. I don't need to spend 10 minutes Photoshopping out an exit sign or something like that. Like they are aware that exit signs exist out in the world. Is it the most photographically perfect thing? No, but right. Like, but so that's what been probably the biggest thing that Imogen has really changed for me is with so many of my images falling into the background there, like think about like how many client orders you've ever had print. Like, so I've taken five, last I checked my, my Lightroom catalog, I had like 4.5 to 5 million photos that I've taken. I've had in 10 years, call it 20 to 30 print orders a year. So you're talking what, 300 print orders and they take, so assume everyone had 10 photos in it. So you are 3000 print orders out of 5 million or 3000 prints out of 5 million photos, right? Like my best album is going to have maybe, maybe 60 to hundred pictures in it, right? Like if I, if I like kind of stretch things and I don't make it the way that I like to. So you're talking like, you're not printing all this stuff. Like a lot of times these pictures, like we take an abundance of pictures. A wedding day, I deliver 600 to 1200 images. Photographers like, well, are my, my, my clients will print, call it like they'll see ever a hundred of those on print, right? And so I was spending so much time and energy on pictures that were just gonna live on a flash drive forever. And that doesn't necessarily negate their importance, but it means like when I'm as a business, I have to invest my time where I have to and so that I can save and actually make a life that I want to enjoy. And I think one of the things that I really love recently about using Imogen is those images that are like, I have to get these images out, they're important to the couple and to a degree, like Imogen gets me all the way there. Like it's, it's not like a like, is it is it technically perfect every single time the way that like if I were to spend every minute like fussing over an image, like probably not, but like, for the like the core of my images because then like i'm really editing like 30 to 50 images per wedding now out of that 600 to 800. And that's like mm -hmm. when you talk about like a time saver like that's insane like and i'm i edit faster yeah. than just about anyone else i know and the fact that i'm now like yeah i spent about 40 minutes in the morning two days after the wedding that's about it like that's insane like that's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous so like my presets and stuff like yeah sure i saved like a couple minutes here and i saved like I, over the lifetime of my career, I've saved a lot by making out presets and doing stuff like that. But when it comes to the future, like with with AI editing and what that offers, like there's just so much that can be done where I don't really have to do much anymore. And I'm not like, yeah, I'm not the best editor in the world and I understand that. But at the same point, like I run a very efficient business that's very, very profitable because I'm able to prioritize things like this. And that's where Imogen has really been a good partner for me. It, can you, we're, we're gonna, we're, yeah. we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about this later. But exit sign removal. Yes. <laughs> Little checkbox. Check the check. <laughs> it's it's one of those things, man. Like, like get I, I get like I get I, I tell my clients pretty openly at the beginning, like, hey, like I'm gonna photograph what's important to you. And so I have like three yeah. or four different surveys where I ask them like, what's important to you? And I'm like, hey, would it be more important for you, or like, would it make sense for me to charge you more money if I went in and did like all this extra editing? Or would you rather me just take it on a photo by photo basis? Because like if they, if I know they're getting a print of something, I'll absolutely take out an exit sign. Like if I know like they're gonna mm -hmm. blow that thing up, like 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 I've got like one of these size prints behind me. Like if they're blowing something up like this, it's gonna feel good. Like I, like I want that thing to look its best. Of course I will pay for right. the extra there. But like I'm not doing yeah. that on the front end for 800 images. Like you right. see the places reception halls put exit signs. Like I'd be doing this all day. Like <laughs> we're so. we're we're in the United States. There'd be two feet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, like gorgeous like tile chandeliers everything no matter which angle yeah. there were like there were like 19 doors and everyone had a, i was like i'm not yeah. doing this like it's not possible <laughs> yeah yeah okay so i i want to take a moment and just ask everybody who's listening if you are at the park with your kids what the letting them play or whatever it is you're hanging out you sit on a park bench take a moment and think about your next business task is it something that you can do while imagine edits your photos let us know by sharing in the Imagine AI community. We want to hear from you what you got lingering for your business so that you know you can be mindful about it and, and work on it next time that your photos are being edited by Imagine. Okay, Dave, we've now talked about the photographic process. We've talked yeah. about business. We've talked about editing. Can you share one thing that you do after a session 
that has increased business? Yeah. One thing after after the session. So yep. when you say increased business, do you mean specifically made me more money or do you like yeah. oh, get, yeah. get you more right. clients, more leads, whatever it is? OK, so I've got a post sale process. And one of the things that a lot of times I see photographers do is they just kind of like, hey, here's your photos. Good luck. Goodbye. Right. Like, and that's right. it. And so yep. there's gallery services out there. I know like shoot proof pick time. I think pixie set does as well, where you can have like email campaigns based on that gallery delivery date where you can say like, Hey, here's your photos. You can do that stuff. But like a lot of times they're just around the gallery and trying to get like print orders and stuff. And there's a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. there. So the day after, if I do a wedding, and so I'm, I'm primarily a wedding person. I, I don't think I've expressed that, but like I do weddings and then I do some commercial stuff. I'm really just a horrible family photographer. Just I'm, I'm bad and I will own that to my core. My kids don't listen to me. Nobody else's kids are going to listen to me. Like there's, there's just absolutely not, not on the table. But when it comes to weddings and commercial, I've gotten very good at managing expectations. And that's where I've spent the entirety of my career, right? With 400 weddings and I don't even know how many commercial shoots now. That's where I really try to spend my time, my energy. And so the day after somebody's wedding, one of the things that happens is at 8 a.m., which nobody on like the world is awake at 8 a.m. the day after their wedding. Usually they've been out to like two, three in the morning after an after party or traveling or doing whatever. But at 8 a.m. they get an email from me that says, hey, congratulations, you did it, awesome, woohoo, you did the wedding thing, it's awesome, right? Here's what to expect to, from me over the next two months. And I outline in that email immediately Hey, I'm going through your photos right now because I call same night of the wedding, right? So I'm going through your photos. I'm going to color correct them. And then we're going to talk about how you want to use these photos. And over the next couple of weeks, you're going to get a few emails from me that talk about print sales and how to print like decorating your house and what that's going to look like and whether or not you want an album. And you might not want an album right now, but you might want one later. So if you want one for your one year anniversary, let me know and I'll follow back up with you then. Or if my labs are running a promotion, and you don't want to pay full price for an album now, but you are interested in one, let me know and I will reach out to you the next time my, al my albums are on sale, right? And so I start doing this stuff. And I use Fundy for a lot of this stuff to kind of like manage the back end of like wall art stuff and, and album design and all that stuff. So it's, it's already a pretty simple, simple process, excuse me. But as I'm doing that, I am painting my client's expectations already to say, hey, you're going to have the opportunity to, to fill your house with your photos from this day. And, and usually like at that point, like they've got some money from the wedding left over, like from wedding gifts, they're getting back into things, they're getting settled. And that first like six week post event thing is a big opportunity. And this is where I get on photographers and I like, this doesn't make me the post pop most popular guy around. But if you have a super long turnaround time, you are missing your sales window because they are by the time if you deliver images and I'll, I'll throw out three months. And this is an example. If you deliver images three months after a wedding day, they are so much less likely to actually order prints from yep. that day. You are losing yep. money. So I deliver in a week, seven to 14 days. If I'm in peak season, occasionally it'll take me 10 to 14 days. But like I prioritize getting that in because it's one of those things that makes me more money. And it also By makes way, my life a lot less stressful. Three months is the average for a wedding photographer. Oh, I know. Delivery. That's I was like, yeah, all maybe. All around the world. <laughs> like, but that's like that's real life, and yeah. like, and, so, and yeah. all it takes, and like, and I, I can speak a little bit confidently on this because I've I've, I've tweaked my process, right? Like, I was one of those mm -hmm. three month people, and now I'm I'm the psychopath that calls the night of the wedding. Like, I will go through, no matter what time it is, I'm culling, I'm importing. Like, I'm I'm yeah. that end of the spectrum now, and I understand that. But the thing, like, all it takes is if you will get. If, if you like, so say your normal turnaround time is two months and you're like doing a backlog rather than like staying ahead on stuff and staying caught up, the risk there is like, all it takes is one thing to happen. I had a ligament, I had a torn ligament in my jaw from a bad dental procedure that knocked me out for like six weeks. And that six weeks, like I, that I, I wound up, I was like, I can't handle this. I had to pay somebody a ton more than I would have cost. Like I took a huge financial bath that year for no reason, just because I was already behind on things, right? I'm like, that's the risk if you not, if you don't get ahead and you stay that stuff, let alone the, the money you're you're missing out on. So it's one of those things that like following up is setting expectations and capitalize on that window. Those moments are fresh, like and you and it's not just the couple that you're getting like those print sales out of. Like you get grandma, grandpa, you get mom and dad, like you get all those people 
Bridal place and print orders early yeah. like that's what yeah. really will drive things home and especially like that's not just a wedding thing for family photographers for other yep. things as well like while that is fresh in their mind and if you've given them a good experience you want to capitalize on that as much as you possibly can this is one of those things that takes a lot of time to set up the aut automating of, of this yeah. whole educational series of emails takes a lot of time to set up but once it's set up it's effortless literally effortless. Well, <laughs> yeah and it's one of those things too that like you don't have to start with the nine email series, right? Like I've been doing this for 10 years. I've shot 400 weddings. I've, I've been all over the States, like doing this stuff. Like yeah. you look at, it's easy to look at me and like, oh, like, yeah, that sounds great. I can't do it. Like it started with one email. The, the reason like this all started was I sent an email, the 8 a.m. email the day after the wedding was just so that I would stop getting the email. Hey, when are my photos gonna be done? Be done? Right. Like, are, are they gonna be ready to like later on today? And I'm like, stop it. Like that's where that email started. So it started off as just one email. And then right. I added in, a sales email a week later. And then I added in an album sale, right? Like it's, you just start, start with what you can do today and make one small change that saves you time. And then continue to think about that three months, six months, eight months down the road of how you can improve this. If you look at your business and how can I save myself more time and how can I make myself more money? Like there's always going to be opportunities, but start small and iterate and test if you can see what works, see what doesn't like make those changes oh, yeah. there. Yeah. Testing is important. So, Now's the part of the show where I want to ask you to look down at your business from a 30,000 foot view, right? If you can share an outline breakdown of your workflow, workflow from lead to delivery, you don't have to go into too mm -hmm. much detail, but some sort of breakdown of, of what your business looks like from a 30,000 foot view. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I am now on the very, very much hands-off trend that I, I would kind of caution people from trying to jump to where, where I am. So like kind of take that as a disclaimer before I go, if you have a ton of leads coming in the door, then you can reduce the contact you spend per lead. So if you have like your websites off the hook, right? Your Instagram is, is always full of, of leads and all that stuff, then you reduce. If you are not getting a ton of those, then I increase and I say, all right, I'm going to spend a little bit more. I'll maybe disable an automation or two and I'll send a personalized text to somebody when they reach out to my contact form, right? Or, or do something like that. But, but mine is very much in the process of most of my leads come online. They come, they find me through my website or through some publication or something like that, that, I, that I've worked with. I do work with a lot of photographers these days, um, more so than just people that have kind of like, hey, I do this thing, like whatever, like a lot of my clients are photographers. And so they'll find me through a blog post, they'll find me through some publication, something like that. So it all comes through contact form first. Usually at that point, I will do one of two things. If it's if it's like, if I, like I said, I'm trying to get more business, I'll be a little bit more high touch. If I'm really overwhelmed, then I will try to do a little bit of a low touch kind of path. But I send automated questionnaires through both of those processes. And then sometimes it's just like a, hey, let's have a conversation. Other times it's, hey, here's everything you need to know to book. That scares people. Photographers love to like meet with every single couple and all that stuff. If you've got enough leads coming in, like it's okay to book people like and just be like, yeah, they're probably good. And like, I think there's a whole rabbit trail whether or not you need to know consultations and all that stuff. But for me, the, the last two years, I've found great success in just not, not doing them. It's been great letting people book and having a streamlined experience. I find that people prioritize the ability to book and have that be in a low effort, a low friction process. And so that's really, everything from there is designed to be as low friction as possible. So I will go through booking. Like I said, I use a CRM. I'll automate a few things throughout that process where they get different questionnaires and different kind of contract type stuff and upsells uh, throughout the kind of like process. I will give them different opportunities to scale up their package if they'd like to kind of like think of like add-ons. I think of them like kind of like Snickers in the checkout aisle at the grocery store. Like I've got these people, they book with me sometimes 18 months ahead of time. If you're hanging in the, the aisle long enough, usually I'll pick up a Reese's or two and I'll throw it in the cart, right? Like it's stuff like that where it's not going to necessarily move the needle on my business, but sometimes those things are an extra three, 400, $500 per print sale or for per client, 20 clients a year. That's a nice little vacation with my family at the end of the year, right? Like, or something right. like crazy. Like, so there, there's stuff you can do on that front. And then when it comes to the actual image and, and processing, I am, like I said, a stickler for getting it right. I will go through, I go through, I shoot that night. I come in from my session immediately, go in a photo mechanic, cull everything down. Then now at this point, I'm dropping that into Lightroom, doing my import with like my metadata stuff and everything, dropping that on. And then it's off to Imogen and then I wait. And like the fact that I'm now sending the stuff off to Imogen at like 
I don't know, some weird hour of night when I when I'm done calling and stuff <laughs> is great because like now like I can take my Sundays off. And so like I'm pretty I'm a pretty big stickler for taking some family time, making sure that like if my spouse was home and she was with like the kids all day yesterday and like while I was off at a wedding or doing something like that, then like I can trade and I can give her time off or we can do something as a family. We can do that stuff. Like I really want photography to be an enabler for me to live the life I want, mm -hmm. not a an entrapment that like is now just another job. Because like a lot of times yeah. photographers get into this and they're like, oh yeah, it's going to be a dream job. And then they like, you could be more profitable making more per hour working some entry level job doing anything else so it's one of those things yeah. that um but yeah from there it goes into that automated kind of email series and it's very like the thing i would challenge everyone to do i use a tool called miro but there's other ones like mural and it's like kind of like a flow chart maker but i kind of outline what that path is for everyone and then like look at like little choices and things like that clients might make oh i'm gonna get a second shooter or i'm not gonna get a second shooter like if you document all that stuff out you you can kind of see opportunities just kind of leap off that page at you and that's how i've gotten to where i'm at right now is that whole flow of like high touch low touch and high priority customer and then like standard priority customers like some people i know are going to come in and spend a whole lot more money which means that like you know what they might have been a low touch i'm now going to jump them into the high touch thing as soon as i realize that like there's a lot of kind of opportunities throughout but as you think like a business and you look at and you map those opportunities out that's where you'll be like oh here's where it is like how did i not think of that earlier I wonder actually how many photography businesses have actually gone and done a flowchart of their of their business work, you know, structures, their systems and stuff. In fact, I, I, I encourage any, everybody who is listening, hopefully you, you're inspired by Dave's, you know, note there that you, that you're, you might take, take the step and do it. So please go to the Imaginary Eye community, share if you've even thought about doing it before. And in fact, if you're even willing to share yours, share it in the community, you know, like share a screenshot of what you've done because it might help others uh, trying to do the same thing. Um, yeah. I'm really curious to see because I've never done it for my, uh, like I said, my business, I purposely keep small. So yeah. um, I've never ne needed to do it, but it's such a good idea to do, especially as your photography business grows and grows and grows and you need to find these things to, um, to make it even better and streamlined. Well, so. That's the thing, like as we're, most photographers, like I want to say the last time I looked at the numbers was like 97% of photographers are solopreneurs, right? Like they are the, the, the one stop shop for getting everything accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. And so with so many of them being on that kind of, on that scale and on that level, we don't necessarily look at our business from kind of a holistic perspective. And I think there is a great opportunity to look at what big businesses are doing. Look at how they make things scalable, right? Like I, I got the joke, I own the domain myphotographerlovestacos.com. That's a, an easy way to get more revenue coming in is make a weird website so that it's memorable for people, right? So I spent a lot of time at Taco Bell. One of the things that Taco Bell does to make things repeatable is like they look at process, they look at scale, like look at any business that's out there. They're looking like Disney Plus, look at how much money they've mm -hmm. made over the past few years, right? And they make it process, make it scalable, make it repeatable. And, and that's the thing where if you can start to do that, you're spending less time in your business, you're making more money and you're able to do what you want to do, like build a better life. Like that's the thing is like, and it starts so small, just document it, just look and see. Like, oh yeah, yeah, of course I could do that. As a completely side note, but related to what you just said, God bless Disney Plus for streamlining the process of making Star Wars shows because even though they're not as good as the original movies, <laughs> it is so much fun seeing these Star Wars content come out as often as it is, including coming up very, very soon with the new Obi-Wan. I, but we got a, we're hosting a party at my house that night just for it. So yeah, anyone's welcome. If you know me in area, swing on by. Um, but yeah, but that's the thing, right? Like it's easier for them to produce things. It's easier for them to create because they streamline that stuff. And if you look at like yeah. big tech and all this stuff that's out there, one of the big things like where a lot of companies will invest their time and energy is in user experience, right? And understanding mm -hmm. that. And the first thing they do, if you like, if you're going in user experience, all right, you're UX 101, I want to dive into this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how the client gets from sign up to value, right? Like that's it. Like, and if you, if it's like, if you sign up on Amazon, how did it, from the time they create an Amazon account or land on the Amazon page to the time they place an order, right? So the time I sign up on Disney plus the time I watch the best star Wars show that I've seen in forever, like whatever that, like <laughs> that connection, that journey across is what we have to understand, diagnose, and hopefully improve for our customers as we go. 
because that's what like makes such a difference as you as you kind of navigate through it all is if you can yeah. identify the journey your customers are taking and then the next step is realizing that you have different journeyers so to speak not every client comes in the door is the same one and there's a lot right. of talk about ideal client and like oh it's just this one client like no you've got Clients that prioritize printing and clients that prioritize digitals and clients that prioritize people and clients that prioritize things on a wedding day. You got all these different people and you want to understand who that client is and what value looks like for them. Because then you get like different maps and you start to go, all right, they're on journey A. This person's on journey C. How can I help them here? And that's when your business really starts to scale up. Mm -hmm. So it's cool stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So earlier you mentioned... Uh, <laughs> removing exit signs yes um, and and this is where i feel like that might come up again potentially yeah. when i ask you this question but what does the future of ai in photography look like to you yeah so i'm, I'm probably a little bit uh, unpopular i tend to be a slow i started out as a very like early adopter right like so when I, i'll use the the nikon I've, I'm, I'm a nikon shooter i have been for for a long time and so when the Nikon D4 came out, I bought a D4 or D, D4S, one of the two, D4S, I think. I bought it the day it came out. And I learned that when you buy it the day that it comes out, it means that Lightroom does not support it and you like should not shoot weddings on that thing or that you're going to have some problems, right? Talk yeah. about that like six week window where you can get yourself in trouble. Like that's a very good way to land in there early. And yeah. so early adopting, when it came to AI, it's something that I was, I came in with a very skeptical approach because as an artist and as a photographer, I know that I shoot five to 10,000 images on a wedding day, I deliver six to 800. If I know what my ratio is, and I know that sometimes I will see four images that are almost the same, but I know that the, the, like the flower girl's face, or the bride's face in one photo, that smile is just better than the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I, AI can't do that for me or whatever. And like, I get kind of like, mm, it's like, I can't trust it to call for me or whatever. Like, and I still kind of stand in, in that in that camp for a little bit, but when it comes to the future of AI, and like, I think, the AI around photography. I think there's so much of an opportunity like editing. Like I do the same thing for every every wedding and every event that I shoot. Every single image that I've basically delivered in the last, I don't even know now, couple years has the same tone curve, the same basic, it's a high contrast, clean look. Like that's what I'm going for. And, and doing that across these images, like oftentimes it's harder for me to get that right than it would be for AI to get that right. Yeah. And so I think that like just streamlining that stuff is is really the foundation. But I look at like the the export problem, the things that I have. Like if I tag something for, for a blog or I tag something for my portfolio or I tag something for different contests or publications, like I think about like integrations, like I know something's gonna be album design in Fundy. I know I love Fundy's album builder, right? So like I think about like tagging a photo there and then having it auto moving in the next step right and I've, you've got ways to make that happen already like i've got like i've played around with photoshop droplets where like you can connect an export plugin to photoshop and then it'll resize it and sharpen it and then save it in a different folder and you can do like all this stuff and with photo but like it's cumbersome and it's not necessarily like yeah i want to do this all the time and the setup process like we're going to talk about a setup process it's awful try to connect a lightroom <laughs> export to a photoshop droplet to like an auto upload sequence. It's not right. zero stars. I do not recommend. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about where photos are coming from, how they're headed. Even just like when I connect a memory card, knowing that it's a memory card and this is where those photos go and here's how they get organized and all that stuff. Uh, there's just immense opportunity yeah. there. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. It's always, it's always nice to hear what, what people think. Typically, the answers are very much involved with calling and editing. So um, it's yeah. nice to hear a different a different perspective on AI in the photo industry. Okay, so you've been using Imagine AI for, for some time now. I am curious, and you've touched on this briefly, but truly, how did Imagine AI impact your life? Oh man, I, so like like I said, like I'm skeptical, right? Like I am like the early adapt. I like had to like publicly apologize to a company that was like, ah, oh, it's stupid and trendy. And then I wound up using their products later on. I wound up being like an ambassador <laughs> for them after I actually tried it. So I was like, oh shoot, like I got to tread carefully here. But like, so when it, when AI editing came out, it was one of those things that I was like, eh, I don't trust it yet. Like I'm not sure. And so like a few people started mentioning Charmy Pena. It was like, you got to you know just do it, just do it. And I was like, all right, fine. Like I'll check it out. And so as I as I as I did it, like the the real time, so I had an engagement 
engagement session I shot for a friend. And this is probably the best example that I have. So like I've used it for a few weddings here and there. And I've like, I've brought in some like paid jobs and stuff, but I had a friend that wanted me to do an engagement shoot for him. And I was like, Hey, yeah, like mm -hmm. you're proposing. This is awesome. Let me, let me come and help. Right. And so I came and I did that as a friend for, uh, as a favor for a friend. Right. And as I came in and I did this, the shoot, like this is coming at a personal expense to, to me. And so normally a photo shoot like that for, for a proposal, that's going to net me a fair, fairly sizable amount of money, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm not the cheapest photographer around. And so as I'm kind of doing this, sorry, <laughs> as I'm um, sharing <laughs> the, the chaos, this is what I'm actually about to touch on, which is funny. As I'm walking through editing this and going through it all, one of the things that I'm doing is I sent it off to image it. So I came home from the proposal, I sent it off, whatever. Once that was off and sent out that night, I was on, I think it was a Sunday or Saturday night that I, I came in from the shoot. So I came in, call, like I said, and I sent it off. All day Sunday, I didn't think about any of it. Like, I didn't think about, like, my pictures or whatever. I, I disabled my phone on the weekend, so, like, I can't access email on Sundays, mm -hmm. like, at all. Like, I can't, I can't check. I don't check my texts. I don't check my, my business stuff at all. And, like, when I came back in ready to start working on Monday, like, that was just good to go. Um, and that, I think, is such a value add that I don't think... Um, people really realize that if you can save five minutes per job and it takes you 10 minutes to set up that first time or even 20 minutes per that first time, it's so valuable to go and go through that and doing like moving to Imogen for a lot of this kind of additional like baseline. It's not even like, like heavy lifting, like the baseline editing just comes back. And like the last wedding that came back, I touched, I think 10 images. I was like, this is good to go. That's three and a half hours back in my life. Yeah. And if I go on like and I'm a, a stickler for hourly rate, like my hourly rate when I first started in photography, started measuring it, it was like six dollars an hour. I was making three hundred thousand dollars a year, so it sounds all fancy, but I was working for six bucks an hour with how many hours I was putting into my business. Now that's that number is a lot closer to two to three hundred dollars per hour take home profit at the end of the year. And that's a big like a big adjustment, right? Yeah. And part yeah. of that is because I find ways like using imaging to to kind of take care of that kind of background stuff and the stuff that I don't need to be doing. I don't need to be killing myself over the computer all the time, just editing and going through this stuff on images that are going to live on a flash drive. The important ones absolutely put in that extra time. But like a lot of the stuff, like I think Imogen has, has been better than me in a few cases. And it's kind of made me mad too. Cause I had one <laughs> where I sent it off and I like, I edited one myself and then I came back and I like, I got it back and I like kind of compared side by side and I was like, Ooh, my greens weren't as good as I thought they were. <laughs> like, like there's been a few cases of that. So I would say for the skeptics out there, like just embrace how much time it saves you. And yeah, I was very much skeptical myself. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad that I'm glad that we were able to free up time so you can wrangle your children and, <laughs> do, you know, it's like, hang that's out it. just enjoy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. Cause like, I, it's, I, you know, we've all kind of become this, you got the remote world that we've all lived in over the past yeah. two years and there's all this stuff has changed, but like, what's really kind of changed for me is like the amount of like what's important and how much time I spend in my business. Like my priorities have shifted massively over the last two years to spend time and like with them being psychopaths at all hours of the day, no matter what is going on. But like, I can embrace that and I can go like, we're going to, we're going to end this call and I'm going to go able, I'm going to go hang out with them for a while. And we're going to go build, oh, you got the mm -hmm. Lego infinity gauntlet and we're going to go oh. build that this weekend. So we're super excited. There's all this like Avenger stuff that we're going to go do, but like I'm able to do that stuff because I've made choices to prioritize the scale and the ability of my business to not just live on my shoulders all the time. Yeah. And it's yeah. like one little thing here and there, using image in here, automating yeah. a blog post here, like these little things, all of a sudden now my 60 hour a week photography job, I work for like five, 10 hours a week. If I'm shooting, I will, the most I'll ever work in a week is 20 hours. It's great. I love it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So Dave, thank you so much for, for joining and, and chatting and sharing your insights. Where yeah. can the listeners learn more about you, connect with you, and of course, see your incredible photography and your love for tacos? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So as I mentioned, my photographer loves tacos.com. That does go to my website for better or worse. At this point, it's part of who I am, I think. Um, 
I will tell everyone I'm not a huge Instagram person or social media. This isn't just like some like thing that I talk about on stage and then I go like, oh, I'm, I'm actually on social all the time. Like I'm not on social. I don't like I'm not active on that stuff. I spend as much time just hanging with my family, interacting with the people around us, doing what we can on, on that front. So my website is DaveShea.com. If you choose to not use the taco link, you can always get in touch with me from there. There's a contact form. I do work with photographers all over the States to try and help them kind of navigate through system management and how to kind of streamline, which is one of those things that's really important to me. But I'm also here and there. You'll find me all over the place in different like communities and stuff on Facebook. I, I will... When I log in, it's usually to join Facebook groups for photographers and just see ways that I can help here and there. But I'm always around, kind of here to help. And yeah, that's about everything. Awesome. I can't wait till finally uh, hang out in person and grab some yeah. tacos with you. <laughs> yeah, it'll be good. I think I'm up there sometime <laughs> sometime this year for, for a wedding or something. So it'll be good. Awesome. So you are invited to be part of the bigger conversation. Join the Imagine AI community today by going to imagineai.com slash community. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you, Dave, so much for that incredible conversation, for sharing your insights from what you've learned over the years, not only as a photographer, but from everything else you're doing in the photography industry. You've been listening to Workflows presented by Imagine AI. To see the show notes and everything referenced in this episode, please go to imagineai.com slash podcast.